200 years ago in Ireland, do we have any Irish here? Good. Talk about excitable. We have Irish. There was a man, this is a very true story, a man named John Estry, Day Estry, actually. He wanted to run for the office of sheriff in Dublin. So he was running to be this, the office of sheriff. He, it was a uh, political office, and he was running, and there was a man who was against him. And his name was Daniel O'Connor. And Daniel O'Connor used to say nasty things to John D'Estry. And Don, John D'Estry got so upset, he did something that's illegal now but was legal back then. He, he uh, said, let's have a duel. Let's fight this to the death. John D'Estry, Daniel O'Connor. Daniel O'Connor hated the man, but he didn't want to kill him. He said no. And then D'Estry, his, uh, you know, his um, personality, his, he was shamed. He said, I want to do a duel. So they agreed. They went 12 miles out of town where you had to go. John's group, Daniel's group. And the way they did it back then is they still had um, round balls, not bullets, right? And the balls, the, the guns, they had dueling guns. The guns weren't rifled. Do you know what rifled means? There's this cylinder that's cut out so that when the bullet comes out, it spins so it goes straight. So many times these balls didn't go straight. That's why you kind of shot at somebody and just hoped you hit them. And so what they did was, something that I think is kind of stupid, but they did it. They flipped a coin to see who would shoot first. Now, if I'm this close to somebody and I hope I won the toss... Well, John D'Estre won the toss, the guy who said, I want to kill you. I want to have a duel. And he shot him and missed him, not because he was a bad shot, but, but because the ball wasn't round, and it went off, and it veered off. So now O'Connor has to shoot him, and O'Connor doesn't want to kill the man. So he aims at his lower leg, hoping just to lame him or give him a flesh wound, and he shoots it, and the ball goes up and hits him right here. The next day, John dies. This is a true story. I know the family involved. True story. John leaves Jane, his wife. Jane has no money because the moneymaker is now dead. O'Connor gave her a little money for years and tried to help her. I mean, the guy who kills the husband's helping. But she got so depressed and so upset, no children, no parents, they had all long died, long ago, this young lady went to commit suicide. So she went out of Dublin, went to a bridge over, not over a river, but kind of over a precipice, and went to that bridge and was standing on the edge of the bridge and was going to stand up on the, the banister and jump off into the cliff or into the valley over this, this precipice. And as she was standing there saying, yes, I'll do it, no, I won't, yes, I'll do it, no, I won't, she started to hear singing. She looked out, and across the precipice was a young man farming. And he was farming the backside. The farm was on the other side of the hill where his dad and family was. He's farming the side that nobody can see. And she's watching him go up and down with such precision and joy, and singing, and she understood they were Christian songs. He's singing hymns and spiritual songs and having a great time, and she's looking at him going, this is a menial task this guy's doing where nobody will ever see what he does or doesn't do, and he has such joy in it. She looked at him and said, if this young man can have such joy at such a menial thing, there must be some meaning to all this life. She got off the banister, and she went back to Dublin. She went into a church because she heard some of the same songs sung one afternoon and went into the church, and she followed Jesus Christ. It's an incredible story. Jane became a Christian. She found a young man. They got married. And Jane spent the rest of her life doing something. She began to pray for the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren that she would never meet and pray that God would reach into their lives the generations that would come. Jane died. 
the children, the children, the children, the children. Elizabeth and I are good friends with her great, great grandson, who's a senior man now, who traces his spiritual heritage, not to Jane, but to the unnamed farmer. The unnamed farmer is who he traces his spiritual heritage to because he understood calling from God and to do something and to do it with such joy and such animation and to realize that God has called each of us to do something, even if it's to be a menial farmer boy in that world. Now farming's not menial, but it was back then. And I just want you to think as we enter into Christmas Advent, God has called each of you to something. First of all, he's called you to himself. If you are a believer, it is unbelievable to understand that God has called you to be a child of the king. You can be a child of the king. Have you ever thought of that? A daughter, a son of the king of kings, the lord of lords, the guy who's going to reign forever, you can be adopted into the family. And if you are adopted and when you are adopted, God has called you here on earth to do something meaningful. And I don't mean stand up here and sing or stand up here and preach or stand down with the children and teach them. I mean whatever you do, God has called you to do it with such animation that people see him in it. That's why the other day I had, we had a businessman share Christ. We had a ballet share Christ, two very disparate things. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God.